Hello and welcome to Sound Strategic, the podcast of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I'm Maya Nowens. In today's episode, we'll examine the domestic responses to COVID-19 in India and Pakistan, and look in particular at the geopolitical implications of the pandemic in South Asia and the Indian Ocean region. Joining me today are two of my colleagues from the IISS South Asia Department, Mr. Viraj Solanki and Mr. Antoine Levesque. Viraj is the Research Associate for South Asia and researches China's Indian and foreign security policy with littoral and island states of South Asia and the Indian Ocean. Antoine is the Research Fellow for South Asia and covers regional nuclear issues as well as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor in particular. Antoine and Viraj, welcome. Thank you, Maya. It's a pleasure being on the show. Hi, Maya. Pleasure to be here. Viraj, let me start with the domestic response in India. Indian Prime Minister Modi uh, has responded to COVID in India um, and his response has garnered worldwide media attention. On the 24th of March, he announced a nationwide lockdown for 40 days with only four hours notice. And as you write in your recent IISS article on the topic, the lockdown has particularly impacted India's urban poor and informal workforce. Can you talk us through why this decision was taken and what the result has been? Thanks, Mayor. Um, as you say, India's coronavirus response has garnered worldwide media attention. And this is in, India's response is important because its citizens comprise one sixth of the world's total population. So India's ability to effectively limit the impact of COVID-19 within its borders will have uh, regional and global implications. India first had uh, a coronavirus case on the 30th of January in the southern state of Kerala. And as of mid-May, it now has over 70,000 confirmed cases and 2,300 confirmed deaths. And this is across 34 of India's 36 states and union territories. And worryingly, cases are continuing to rise. There's approximately 4,000 new cases a day. And India's coronavirus peak is expected in the next few weeks towards uh, June and July. And therefore, as you said, to lim try and limit the spread of this virus across uh, India, Prime Minister Modi announced uh, a nationwide lockdown with four hours notice uh, on the 24th of March. And then this has been extended twice, once on the 14th of April for a further 19 days, and then again on the 4th of May. So India's current uh, lockdown procedure is for 54 days in total, and uh, extensions of this uh, in some form are likely. And uh, within this, only essential businesses, so grocery shops and pharmacies, have been permitted to open throughout the lockdown. And there have been restrictions on uh, road and air transport, which is suspended throughout the country. But now there's been a gradual easing of some of these restrictions as uh, each uh, extension of the lockdown is announced. So uh, passenger train operations have begun again on the 12th of May, and the country is now being split into different zones. Um, each district within the country is split into either a red, which is a hotspot zone, an orange zone, and a green zone. And those in the green and the orange zones are permitted to have more activities within their districts. But uh, notably within India, uh, healthcare is not uh, run by the central government, it's run by the state uh, governments. And each state is facing its own challenge in dealing with this virus. And for example, the capital Delhi, uh, Maharashtra, which is home to the city of Mumbai, uh, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu account, these four states account for two thirds of all of India's cases and two thirds of in all of India's total deaths. Whereas in Kerala, which had the first coronavirus case on the 30th of January, now has 95% um, of those who have tested positive for the virus in Kerala have since recovered and it's only seen four deaths. And so there's a wide variety in the different states and uh, how they're coping with this. And this has taken the form of also some states unilaterally 
deciding to extend their own lockdowns um, beyond the government's advice. So the state of Telangana has unilaterally announced that it will um, extend its lockdown regardless until the 29th of May. But I think India's case is important because enforcing social distancing throughout um, the country is difficult as hundreds of millions of Indians live in densely pop populated areas, including in heavily congested slums. So um, monitoring the number of cases, especially in these slums, is difficult. And these are real areas of concern across India. And it's also had um, a big impact upon India's economy. India was uh, growing at around 5% in financial year 2019-20. It had been growing at around 7% in the previous years. And now the uh, closing of workplaces has really has caused unemployment to rise to a record high of over 27%. Over 122 million people are now said to be unemployed in India and 27 million people between the ages of 20 and 30 have been lost their jobs. So this is a real concern, as is um, the effect of the lockdown on the country's 40 million migrant workers, who, of which 10 million of these are said to have been stranded in uh, across the country and are now starting to return home. So will rebuilding the economy also and, and, and addressing the rising unemployment also fall um, to the responsibility of the states or will that be our central government responsibility moving forward? I mean, it seems from your answer and how this has been approached so far that there has almost been a mismatch between central government priorities and policies and, um, you know, a, a practical um, and real limitations on the ground in, in different regions. Yes, that's correct. So the case of managing the economy falls within it's a central government responsibility, but each state also has its own challenge. So at the central government level, the India's finance minister announced a uh, $22.6 billion stimulus package in March. And this is equivalent to around 0.8% of India's GDP. And it's been provided to help its poorest citizens with uh, cash transfers and free food. But, um, there's concerns that uh, this stimulus package is not reaching all of India's different migrant workers within each uh, state of the country and those that are now moving between um, states uh, who are now returning home. So the ability to actually ensure, the central government's ability to ensure that um, this is being distributed evenly is difficult. And I think there's now been calls here within India for another stimulus package to be offered by the, to be provided by the central government. That's interesting. In Pakistan, um, I believe that provinces is, have also taken a, a leading role in responding to the crisis. Um, whilst Prime Minister Imran Khan is argued against a lockdown at the start uh, for fear of increasing poverty rates and an economic slowdown, I think provinces ruled by his own party went against his order and locked down all but essential businesses on their own accord. Is that correct, Antoine? Yes, Mayor, this is um, the picture in Pakistan. It matters because Pakistan is a country of 210 million people and it's um, suffering from the same um, very hard policy dilemmas which all other countries are having to resolve with their own national resources. And Pakistan, just to give you a snapshot, um, as of today, 12th of uh, May, um, is um, suffering from 31,000 uh, plus official cases. The first case was uh, identified on the 26th of February in Karachi. Um, there are over 700 official fatalities, uh, the first one of those having been officially uh, declared on the 18th of March. And the response from the central government um, at the helm of a federal um, uh, state system uh, came um, in the form of sweeping restrictions imposed at the end of March 
which have been um, uh, reinstated uh, since. And this week, um, we have started seeing uh, an evolution to um, uh, a, D, uh, a form of, of smarter lockdown um, with emphasis on testing and tracing. But to come back to your original question, there is um, a real uh, challenge in managing the uh, provinces versus um, the uh, uh, whole of government um, uh, federal um, uh, structure of, of government. And, and, and really, that discrepancy is one amongst others uh, which has made uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan's uh, government response to uh, the COVID uh, crisis so um, very um, uh, difficult to handle. Right. Um, I mean, I think in, in all countries, we're seeing a, a, contest, um, a contestion almost of, um, uh, of a, you know, a lack of resource, national resources, as you say, whether that be manpower um, for, um, you know, opting then a, a, ho a high tech approach, um, other countries opting for a low tech approach when it comes to tracking and tracing. And I noted that there were reports in uh, Pakistan of a, of a high tech approach of tracking and tracing. Um, there's been reports that the Inter-Services Intelligence Director, the ISI, um, have been using their own surveillance technology to enforce quarantine measures, for example, and that this was a, a technology that was first developed um, for counterterrorism efforts. Um, can you speak a little bit to this? Yes, I mean, that um, particular report um, has, has not been officially, uh, I think, um, confirmed. Um, uh, but it makes a lot of sense that um, the instruments um, of uh, uh, state surveillance, which um, the state of Pakistan has to prevent terrorism, um, be put to use in the context of this unprecedented crisis. Um, in uh, 2014, uh, when uh, Pakistan started um, a major counter-insurgency and counter-terrorism operation uh, called Zabi Azb um, in the country, um, the military uh, led uh, what it then started calling um, intelligence-based operations. And these have been tremendously successful in uh, bringing down the um, uh, rate of terrorism and the incidence of terrorism in, in the country. Um, and there is obviously now a cap capability which the security apparatus uh, of Pakistan more widely is able to put to um, the profit of the um, combat against the coronavirus. The chief of uh, Pakistan's um, ISI um, has met the Prime Minister twice, at least by public uh, reporting. And this has really shown that um, the um, intelligence um, apparatus is being mastered to its uh, full uh, capacity to really help the state um, uh, get over this uh, crisis. Right. I mean, I think um, Prime Minister Khan uh, went on the record to say that ISI's surveillance technology um, was useful in the response to COVID um, to enforce quarantine measures um, quite recently. And, and I, 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 you know, it points to the role of um, militaries around the world uh, playing um, a significant part in combating um, national epidemics, um, particularly when it comes to COVID, um, as we've seen in China, um, or, you know, across um, Southeast Asia, um, but also, as, as you rightly mentioned, in Pakistan. But I've also read reports that um, the military's role, whilst Prime Minister Khan says that um, he, the government has the military's full support, uh, might actually signal that there is a contention between the government and the military um, branch of government in 
towards Prime Minister Khan's initial hesitant response. How much truth do you think there is to this and, and what does it mean for the stability of the current government? I think it's an important factor. Uh, civil military relations are always um, an important consideration when uh, looking at uh, policy outcomes in Pakistan. I think it's also early days to assess really um, this uh, particular aspect of the uh, of the crisis response uh, in Pakistan, but it is um, clear that. Um, the role of the military has been uh, central to the state's um, response uh, to the domestic crisis. Um, in um, early uh, or late, late March, there was um, uh, deployment of uh, military uh, and paramilitary personnel across the country to help in um, uh, uh, in 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 the uh, civil led response to uh, to the crisis, and more widely, um, there have been um, uh, a number of uh, challenges in civil military relations in Pakistan, which uh, are still uh, very much present in the country. And um, these um, really have been. Uh, uh, in recent months um, uh, uh, fostered by the military's um, uh, interest and perhaps even concern at the state of the economy and its um, perception that the economy of Pakistan, even before the crisis, really uh, uh, needed uh, some strong interventions uh, in order to get it back to where it should be. And that uh, particular point really is is about um, keeping Pakistan on track uh, to becoming uh, a full-fledged developing market economy as opposed to a frontier market. And this uh, particular priority, which um, really determines so many other aspects of uh, the um, uh, governing elite of Pakistan's plan for their own country, is now in jeopardy because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, it's um, a very hard hit to the economy. And so uh, the military, uh, but also other segments of uh, Pakistani uh, elite uh, business primarily, are uh, concerned about uh, the implications of, um, of uh, the crisis for uh, the future of the country. I mean, speaking on the future of the country, I think that's a perfect segue to move to Pakistan and Indian relations, um, bilateral relations in particular. I mean, last year we saw tensions flare between both sides with border skirmishes. And of course, Prime Minister Modi's contentious decision to strip Kashmir of its special status um, in late 2019. Has the COVID crisis allowed both sides to temporarily distract from uh, from from bilateral tensions? Or has there, do you think, been um, a risk of increased escalation um, in, in this relationship? I think the context which um, was established after this uh, crisis uh, in February last year, which um, involved um, a terrorist attack in uh, Indian administered Kashmir, an Indian um, Air Force led conventional strike deep inside Pakistan and a Pakistani counter response in Indian airspace um, is a context which, despite COVID, um, is still very much uh, in place between um, India and, and Pakistan. The IISS hosted General Khalid Kidwai, an advisor to the National Command Authority of Pakistan last February. And it was very clear from uh, the gist of his public remarks that um, uh, Pakistan is uh, uh, giving uh, priority to a defense posture which favors a quid pro quo plus response to any future Indian um, uh, provocation uh, from the Pakistani perspective. And this uh, confirms that the uh, context remains unchanged from uh, more than a year ago. 
And we've seen in recent days and weeks that um, tensions and rhetoric between India and Pakistan has not abated. Um, if anything, the tensions on the line of control remain uh, very high and rising compared to last year. The um, ceasefire violations which both countries are referring to um, are uh, increasing compared to last year. And so we're looking at a situation where the COVID crisis is uh, at best really putting a lid on the situation, um, but may otherwise uh, really just delay a number of uh, um, dynamics which uh, really have an escalatory uh, trajectory between the two countries. Faraj, do you want to add something? Yes, just on India-Pakistan relations, um, there's been a heightening of rhetoric recently regarding coronavirus and India-Pakistan relations as well. So, for example, the uh, Indian Army chief has said, uh, whilst other countries are providing assistance as Pakistan continues to export terror, there's been calls from the Pakistani side that India is continuing to carry out uh, so-called false flag operations. This is um, worrying and minimizing this rhetoric will be key to ensuring a decrease in tensions. Right, I think that's a little bit more of a positive note on a very serious topic. Um, Antoine, if I could turn to Pakistan's other significant bilateral relationship, the one it has with China. I mean, until now, roughly 20 billion worth of projects have been invested in Pakistan for the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Project, which is the uh, flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. And whilst Beijing and Islamabad, I believe, will be keen to reaffirm their strategic partnership and their all-weather friendship um, and the success of CPEC. Um, I believe a, a report was tabled before Pakistan's National Coordination Committee, which stated that Chinese companies working on CPEC projects will suffer delays and higher costs. So how has COVID affected CPEC and um, how do you see this moving forward? The information about uh, CPEC is uh, patchy when it really comes to implementation at the best of times. Um, so it's very difficult in that context to assess really um, the practical progress being made against this most important project for Pakistan and a uh, project of considerable importance for China also. Um, it's very clear from a number of official statements, including the lead coordinator um, for CPEC on the Pakistani side, um, that um, there is full commitment on uh, the Pakistani side to really implement CPEC. Um, there have been many statements and we um, uh, should expect CPEC to continue regardless of uh, uh, the um, COVID disruption. China and Pakistan are um, fully committed politically to this project, albeit for different reasons. And so we're going to see some uh, slowing, possibly, of uh, some of the more emblematic projects, uh, not least uh, around debt uh, considerations uh, and the greater restructuring of the financial priorities of uh, the state of Pakistan. But um, we could expect um, that the um, CPEC more generally uh, as a concept, uh, if not as a set of uh, practical projects, will uh, continue for the foreseeable future. Um, on that note, China has promised debt relief to the least developed countries uh, in the world. Um, I was wondering, uh, whether a similar um, request uh, might be granted uh, to Pakistan. I noted that Pakistan, along with other high-risk countries, has now also approached China for debt relief um, in the form of ease and payment obligations from China. Um, but of course, this is in a greater context of wider calls for debt relief um, from Pakistan's bilateral lenders. How much pressure do you think this is going to be? Uh, this is going to put on? Um, Beijing to, to grant uh, Pakistan's uh, request for ease in payment obligations from China? I think the um, particularity of the Pakistan-China relationship really uh, comes to the fore in uh, this question. 
Um, we shouldn't forget that um, there will be pressures to really um, discuss or rediscuss the terms of uh, some of the already concluded uh, agreements part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. But the um, spectrum which is covered by the Pakistan-China relationship is indeed very, very wide. Um, you could, uh, I think, um, legitimately argue that it's still mostly driven by a military-to-military -military, uh, core. And this means that there are plenty of options for trade-offs in other parts of the relationship, which may ease some of the uh, challenges uh, either side may see on um, debt restructuring and otherwise uh, renegotiations of some of the terms which had been uh, agreed to in previous years. I mean, moving to India then, India also plays a large regional role in South Asia and the Indian Ocean, um, particularly with island states, um, as Viraj, you will well be expert in um, following your research on this topic. So over the past few years, we've seen a growing contest between India and China for influence in the Indian Ocean region and India's government becoming increasingly concerned over a growing Chinese strategic presence in the region. How has India been able to leverage the COVID pandemic to strengthen its role in the region through its bilateral relationships? That's a great question, Maya. On um, India's role within the region, it's really taken the crises as an opportunity to strengthen its relations with uh, regional neighbors and engage with them. So it's using primarily, uh, with India being the largest provider of generic drugs globally, it's drawing on its prominent and growing pharmaceutical industry to provide supplies of paracetamol and other um, drugs to over 85 countries globally. And it's providing medical supplies for over 120 countries globally, but more notably in the region, it's um, playing an active role in providing assistance to Indian Ocean island states. So India sent uh, four batches of medicines to Sri Lanka. It's also sent a naval ship to, the, to five Western Indian Ocean states, Maldives, Mauritius, Madagascar, Comoros, and Seychelles. And this is the first ever time that India is covering a single assistance mission to all of these uh, five Western Indian Ocean island states. And this forms a growing part of India's engagement with these uh, island states, especially since it was given observer status of the five member Indian Ocean Commission regional grouping of which four of these nations uh, belong to. And therefore, even though Madagascar and Comoros are not part of, do not fall under the Indian Foreign Ministry's Indian Ocean region division, they actually fall under Africa. I think this now is a signal that all of these five countries fall under Indian, India's Indian Ocean policy and India's continuing to provide assistance to these. But uh, notably, um, China is also engaging with these island states. So India sent uh, four batches of medicines to Sri Lanka. China has sent three and also provided a $500 million financial loan. And this is part of its engagement with trying to uh, reach out to the new government in Colombo. And uh, China is also providing uh, assistance to uh, the Maldives and to Mauritius and other island states. And it's trying to highlight that, um, for example, in the Chinese ambassador to the Maldives highlighted the Belt and Road Initiative within uh, an op-ed that he wrote and in, uh, in one of the Maldivian local papers and the need to continue cooperation in this. So I think there's interesting engagement between the two. And one notable example is, uh, for example, Huawei, the Chinese technology firm, is engaging in uh, epidemic relief across the Indian Ocean by providing video conferencing systems to the Sri Lankan government, to the Mauritian government, who is trying to court to be part of the BRI and also to Maldives. Interesting. I mean, is that done, do you think, with government support or is that, um, is that uh, opportunistic business moves? I think it's a mix of both, uh, especially in the Mauritius, for example. It's 
Mauritius hasn't formally signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. So now um, the Chinese government and uh, Hawaii are now partnering with local hospitals, for example, to provide video conferencing technology so that there can be greater communication between Mauritius uh, Mauritian and uh, Chinese doctors. So Antoine, have you seen similar um, measures by China in responding and helping um, Pakistan in its COVID response? Yes, absolutely. Um, China and Pakistan are very uh, close countries. And as part of that closeness, Pakistan helped um, China in the earlier uh, months of this crisis by sending PPE um, and other assistance to China. Um, Pakistan supported um, uh, China politically in the earlier months of this crisis. And now we're seeing um, the reverse uh, happening from China to Pakistan. Um, medical help, um, doctors from China coming into uh, Pakistan to advise on health uh, response issues and um, plenty of other uh, material help. This is important in the context of uh, this long-standing relationship between uh, China and Pakistan, and it matters also in the context of uh, Pakistan's uh, overall uh, foreign policy goal of balancing out its relations between uh, China on the one hand and the United States on the other. There is a very big question uh, relating to uh, whether Pakistan is able to um, uh, compensate for any increase of relations with China um, in its relations with the United States in the months to come. That's fascinating, Antoine. And I think that's a perfect segue into the last question I wanted to ask on multilateral cooperation in the region, because of course, bilateral relationships do not exist in a vacuum. Um, Viraj, in your recent article, you mentioned that the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, or SARC, um, held its first meeting since 2014, if I did not read that incorrectly. How significant was this meeting? And are there any other regional responses that either of you think we should be paying attention to? Thanks, Mayor. On uh, SARC, I think this is a very interesting case because it, uh, the meeting at a leader level summit came about um, via India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's instigation. And as you said, uh, this was the first uh, leader level summit of SARC, although this was virtually since 2014. And uh, within this, uh, one of the most significant outcomes was that uh, Narendra Modi established a voluntary COVID-19 emergency fund to be used by SARC nations for, uh, for urgent medical supplies and equipment. And this amounts to around $22 million at the moment. And this, the more significant part of this meeting taking place is that following the leader level summit, there's been a gatherings of health professionals and trade officials from the SARC countries. And this is really important uh, in terms of sharing best practices, especially with the smaller states of South Asia and the Indian Ocean. So I think it's important, even if uh, there's been differences in SARC, and that's the reason, especially between India and Pakistan, and that's the reason why a meeting, uh, a leader level meeting hadn't taken place in six years. But I think it's important, even if the leader level meetings do not take place, that uh, the meetings of health professionals from across South Asia continue in terms in order to share best practices, especially with those smaller states of South Asia. And in terms of the wider region, um, in terms of multilateral initiatives that are, you, people should keep an eye on at the moment, uh, there are quite a few that India has been engaged in. In the wider Indo-Pacific, it now has uh, two separate uh, dialogues on COVID with the other three members of the uh, quadrilateral security group, the United States, Japan, and Australia, and also um, with South Korea included in this group at the moment, because India has one dialogue with these uh, four countries uh, at the foreign ministerial level, along with Israel and Brazil, and also at the foreign secretary, US deputy secretary of state level with Vietnam and New Zealand on one hand, 
And on the other hand, it has a foreign ministerial meetings. It's participated in foreign ministerial meetings of the BRICS grouping, which includes China and Russia. And it's also engaged in the G20 Leaders Summit and Commonwealth Health Ministers meeting. So India is really engaging widely with multilateral institutions. And I think this is uh, important as India's um, ability to engage with these regional partners and key Indo-Pacific partners will be important in ensuring that it's able to play a meaningful regional leadership role in helping to combat uh, the virus across South Asia and the wider region. Excellent. Well, I'm going to leave it on that hopeful note. And thank you both for joining me today and providing your insights into this topic. And thank you to our listeners as well for joining us today. Please subscribe to Sound Strategic for more in-depth discussions just like this. And to keep up to date with the latest trends in international security, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram. See you next time.